Hello, it's Alan Schimmel, DevOps.com, DevOps TV, and we're here in London at the DevOps Enterprise Summit UK 2018. And we have another great panel here lined up. Let me introduce our panel, and actually I'm going to have our panel introduce ourselves themselves. From our far right here, we have Finn. Yeah, I'm Finn Goulding. I'm uh, the international CIO at Aviva, and that's uh, I look after the countries which are across Europe and, and India, not UK. It's a Brexit thing. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping. So you do UK as well. Yeah. Okay. And next to Finn, Yelena. Um, my name is Jelena Lakitic. Uh, I'm a head of uh, UBS uh, Asset Management SWAT. Um, and uh, I work and live in Switzerland. UBS is a Swiss bank, so I'm basically in a headquarter. Uh, and yeah. Fantastic. And this gentleman? I'm Mark Schwartz. I am an enterprise strategist with AWS. That's a new title. It is, yes. <laughs> is, it, also, is it clear what I do? Um, of course <laughs> it is. But you know, you be, you're also a, a esteemed DevOps author. I am. Multiple. I, I don't know if I'm esteemed, but I'm an but author, of author two books and yeah. a third one on its way, I hope. Really? Yes. Oh. I'm going to keep you busy interviewing me next year. Yeah. Hey, look, it's job security <laughs> for me, Mark. <laughs> uh, so, guys, welcome. Welcome to our panel. Who, who presented it at, uh, does this year? Mark? I mean, yes, we are all these guys are later. But we're right. the last two. We're the last two. two. You're closing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. you yeah, must shift. think you have a great. Uh, presentation I if you're so. closing no. it up. Let's I don't know. <laughs> so why don't, we, why don't we hear about what you're, let's go with you guys, what are you presenting on? So I'm presenting on flow, so the way that um, work in organizations could be improved from ideas right through to delivery and DevOps was a part of that and I kind of saw um, in my career lots of challenges with Agile and Agile with capital A where it should be little a, something that you are, not something that you buy, mm -hmm. and started to see that even more, that actually what we're missing is how we bring executives into this and how we actually bring customers in. So yeah, I've written a couple of books, and, um, and it's, again, it's all about how we can improve the ways of working. It's turning technical agility into business agility, basically. Fantastic. Sounds good. Yelena? Well, I haven't written any books, first of all, uh, and my talk is, uh, is about the last 12 years of my experience with injecting Agile and DevOps uh, at UBS. So I've been, I will be talking about my current role, uh, but I will also go back in time and talk about everything that happened before and that led me to this role and, and the ways th that I you know, discovered what, how to do things in a better way um, through observing or trial and error or um, you know, usually trial and error. Um, but, uh, but basically, with my, with my current role, I had a chance to build up the concept by myself, which actually enabled me to use all of that, that experience, and that's basically what I'm exploring. Fantastic. Mark? I spoke this morning, and my topic was, what does it mean to lead IT? So uh, you're familiar with my, my last book. This, this was an obsession of mine over the last few years, trying to understand a little better what it means to lead an IT organization now that we've moved into the world of DevOps and agility and the cloud and so on. Uh, I think a lot of the agile conversation is around individual teams and how they perform. Uh, and um, at least before I wrote my book, I wasn't seeing anything in the literature about how agility changes the the job of the leader, essentially, you know, aside from having lots of agile projects going on, does it actually make a difference in what you do as a leader? What do you need to be an agile leader? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean just agile yeah. little a, yeah, yeah. but maybe it's a big <laughs> a, right? Yeah. Does that leader need to be an agile person? Um, and you know what? So all three of you are excellent candidates for the topic of our panel today, which is leadership. Right, DevOps leadership. So, you know, I, I, I really started to explore this with Gary Groover back when he uh, wrote, I guess it was his second book. Leading uh, the Transformation. Leading the yeah. Transformation. And, and, you know, I had a chance, Gary and I did a whole series of podcasts on this and, and talked about, you know, what's the role of a leader? First of all, let, let's start with this basic premise I'm going to ask all three of you to kind of comment on it and then, 
can you have a successful DevOps transformation without adequate, it doesn't have to be excellent, mm -hmm. but at, at least adequate leadership? No way. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Easy Just question. Um, well, we, um, we always advise companies that they're going to need executive sponsorship for their transformation. But I, I think um, I, I wouldn't want to discourage people who are leading change from somewhere else in the organization, right? You can, you can have a change agent who is somewhere in middle management and has to manage down and up. You could have a grassroots movement. Eventually, they're going to have to convince somebody senior to get on board. I don't disagree. Yeah. It can be very tough, I think. Sometimes you're trailblazing a little bit, and then it can be quite lonely because <laughs> everyone's standing back to see, well, is he going to be successful or <laughs> she, or are they going to fail? And um, so you sometimes don't have the support of your colleagues. I mean, I first implemented DevOps in 2012 at a previous company, and even the staff hated it. They didn't like it. Now, many years later, all of their LinkedIn profiles are DevOps engineer, DevOps architect. So I think sometimes when you're out there on your own, you have to be pretty strong, I think. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that um, there's a certain amount of the practice that you can adopt and nobody's going to get in your way, yeah. right? Um, it, certain things are just good practice, let's say automating deployments, for example. Um, you can do that at a grassroots level. The real challenge is harvesting the business value that you can get out of these things, right? You could set up a beautiful DevOps practice. You can, you can be doing all the right things. But the company is not going to get the benefit of that unless certain things change at the senior leadership level and they rethink how they decide what to invest in and, and how to flow uh, yep. requirements into right. the system. Yep. I mean, I, I think for any kind of change, you do need both. You need a top-down support and you, ha you need also bottom-up. Right. And that's the only way really to do something. If you only have one, you will not be able to pull it. And actually, leaders for me, um, and maybe even more important leaders for me, are the leaders that are more on a, on a hands-on level jobs. Because they're the ones that need to motivate the people that are actually implementing whatever your vision is. So in this case, we're talking DevOps and Agile. Mm -hmm. We could be talking about something else in a few years. But if you don't have an ally, an ambassador on this level, you know, like really uh, in the trenches, then you are actually not going to be uh, able to achieve anything. It's just going to be one of the empty strategies, you know, one great talks, mm -hmm. and nobody will do the work. And so, on the other hand, obviously, if you are just doing the work, but you don't have anyone to recognize it, promote it, and encourage it, you will also be stuck. So I think you need it on both sides. What about middle out? I, 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 Mark or, or Finn, one of you mentioned, you know, you need some, min, maybe you can do it from middle management, or, you know, that middle yeah. out, because I've been down. Because, I, you know, I think on the, depending on the scale and complexity of your organization, you're a fool to think you're going to get anything accomplished. It's just like you know, an army works on its sergeants, mm -hmm. not its yeah. generals, mm -hmm. necessarily, right? Yeah. And without that middle management in some organizations, I don't care how much the CIO or the leadership wants it. Yeah. You, need, you need that mid-management buy-in and mm -hmm. support. I, yeah. I actually do agree with that. And I actually think that middle management is bottleneck for many things. Yeah. And, and actually, I've seen this in, in our company as well. Um, and, and this is why you need a, a top management to be very much aware because they're the ones that can bring the good layer of middle management or remove the bad ones. Because if you don't solve this, I agree with you, you will not move uh, anywhere. And it's not even about the change, is actually supporting the people that are doing the change, their career, advertising the teams, all these little things that actually people need uh, as a kind of daily support to do their job. I think we, we have to change one thing about the way we've always thought about middle management, which is it's, it, it shouldn't be a span of control question, right? You need, you need enough, uh, traditionally, you need enough middle managers so that you don't have too many people reporting to each of them, and that's how you decide what your structure looks like in the middle. 
And uh, I'm not, I, I think that sort of misses the point. You know, if you've got good autonomous teams that can, that can self-motivate and self-energize and all of that, span of control becomes less of an issue. But as you said, um, there's a book I really like. It's called Engineers of Victory by uh, Kennedy. It's about World War II, and it's essentially his thesis is that the war was won by middle management. Sure. You know, it's uh, the people who could stimulate the right engineering efforts and the right innovation to solve the real problems that the armies were facing at the time. Yeah, you know, I, I think part of that is 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 business buy it. Right? It's not just necessarily business stakeholders, the sales team or the executive mm -hmm. board that buys it. A good leader gets his team bought in, mm -hmm. right? And now, conversely, I'm going to throw something out at you guys and in, interested in your thoughts, and that is I've heard that the people who are affected the most, who could you know, conceivably lose their jobs, and during these DevOps transformation is middle management. Because as we automate and consolidate and, and you know, uh, break down these silos, we, maybe we need less middle management. You, Finn, you've done this in a few organizations. Yeah, I what think, do you think? Yeah, you're definitely challenging traditional organizational structures. That's part of the problem. And what you describe is well known as the frozen middle. Right. It's, it's our job to show them where their career paths will go, and maybe it's going to be even better. You know, it was, I mean, uh, IT leaders don't build the systems that people do, but I would like to build them as well. You know, I'd like to get out of my job description a little bit and actually have more variety. And I think that's the path you have to show for some of the individuals in your teams, because all of us, I don't know about yourselves, but we're all looking for people and talent. So why not retrain? Why don't you give skills to these individuals to do other things? Yeah, so I like that idea, sure. actually. And I think, uh, I, I do agree with you. I think that has to, we have to have a shift in, in a sense of all the jobs. I don't believe that in today's world where it's all about multi-skills, it's, it's very silly to actually define one-dimensional jobs mm -hmm. when we are all multi-dimensional and you know, we're always trying to have this work-life balance and why not mixing that up also in the job? So if you look at it at that, maybe we will not call it anymore uh, mm -hmm. middle management, but these, were, these are going to be the people that are actually you know, hands-on yep. if they want to be mm -hmm. or more leaders and more kind of admin people if they want to be, depending of, of their skills, but mm -hmm. also what, what they feel they should be doing at certain times of their careers. Yeah, and I would add that uh, even middle managers within an IT organization very likely also have business skills and understand how the organization works, and so maybe their role shifts a little bit mm -hmm. to be a little bit more uh, directly involved with customers or with business operations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to give you two kind of counteracting views here that are, they're, you know, they're, they're diametrically opposed. One is, don't underestimate people's fear of change, right? People get comfortable getting a paycheck every two weeks or however your pay periods are. People need stability, dependability. This is why they often work for a larger organization versus a, you know, more entrepreneurial kind of role. Is right? They want that. I, I was a CIO in the government. Right. So you know, <laughs> yeah, it's such a, I still love going to my government customers. And <laughs> on their their screensaver was their retirement countdown, right? <laughs> but but you know, so don't underestimate what a role that plays. So you may tell them, Finn, mm -hmm. hey, this may work out good for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I got it good right now, thanks. Yeah, right, yeah. and it, as miserable as my life is, yeah, yeah. that I'd be willing to jump to another job for a three percent increase. Because think about how many of us in the IT industry hop around like fleas onto a new dog for a couple dollars more. Yeah. Right. So how happy and and motivated are you he in just your job? Us fleas. Did yeah. you hear that? <laughs> well, I, not, not you. You're, you're leaders. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but no, I mean. Think about the IT industry where instead of asking for a raise, we, we go to another job all too often. Yeah, no, you're right. right. And that, is, that is a challenge because I think that from my perspective, it's not just middle management. It's me as well. It's other people. It's like mm -hmm. what's our role in a future paradigm and the way that things are going to happen, the way things are going to get built, etc. 
So I think you have to have the ability as a leader to be a storyteller, to show the journey you're going on, and you have to have something that's uh, tangible for those people, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and including yourself, because you are disrupting a lot of hierarchy and older ways of working with new flatter structures, so it's tough. And I actually think that all of the digital transformation comes from cultural transformation, so I've been focusing much more on people these days, and less about technology. In fact. That's one of the things that I kind of do for fun. That's why I write the books. <laughs> but my day-to-day -day work is really just about people. Mm -hmm. there, there's an interesting force that counteracts the one that you just mentioned, which is I, I think people who are actually executing tend to have a lot of ideas about how to improve things. You know, they're, they, they see what doesn't work really well, and they would love to change it. And often they're in a situation where they're not allowed to make that change. There are impediments to mm -hmm. making change. And you can get a lot of energy and enthusiasm coming from removing those impediments and saying, you know, part of this change is you guys with the ideas, that's what we're counting on now. So keep them coming. Yeah, I, I think that is... But again, you need the people's buy-in to understand that, yeah. yes, there are no ulterior motives here. There's nothing, you know, there's no tricks up my sleeve kind of thing. I really do want your buy-in. And I want your in input, and I, I value you as a person. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, you know, there's the, look, I'm the CEO of a small company, but, and I, but I've also been, you know, executive leadership at larger companies. Storyteller, so I used to call it selling the dream. Right? There's absolutely the selling the dream aspect of it. But there's also, you have to be a cheerleader. Yeah. But you also sometimes have to be the adult in the room, right? And, yeah. and that, that's a sucky job because <laughs> I'm a kid is. at heart, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, but, but we all, I think, is, as part of being a good leader, you, you need mm -hmm. to do that too sometimes. I, you know. I agree. And I, I think, look, I don't think there is really a, a one formula how to do and how to relieve people from fear. I mean, the one thing you can try is actually really to try to understand where is this fear coming from. And then maybe you can solve it by giving a good vision or a story or even helping this person achieve maybe the job that they will still feel, feel comfortable, comfortable in, but that it's a part of that change. I mean, you, you can't really tell exactly which way to go. I think you also have to acknowledge sometimes that if you are not able to provide this uh, for, for particular people, then maybe you should also encourage them to move on, to find their own happiness, because you can't actually, uh, you know, provide happiness for everybody. And at the end of the day, you want to work with motivated people. Uh, and, and this is being an adult in a room. Right. Uh, you have to then at one point uh, say that everybody are responsible for their choices and their happiness. And uh, you know, for the sake of the team, or for the sake of that person, but also for the sake of your team, you should then encourage somebody to move forward or you know, step back and think what they want. Mm -hmm. So that, so I just had that with an employee at my organization. Uh, it's coming home from RSA San Francisco, but a month and a half, two months ago. And I basically wrote, first I told them if they didn't like things, the door was over there. But, because <laughs> I was that upset. But then on reflection, I sat down and wrote a letter that, hey, I love what you bring to the company, and I think you are a talented, talented person. Here are the things, though, that are just driving me, and not just me, but the rest of us crazy. Mm -hmm. And if you want to work on with them, work on them. We're willing to work with you on them, but we got to change where we are, right? Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, as a leader, this was a really hard. It was like I poured my heart out into this mm -hmm. <laughs> long email I wrote, but it worked. I mean, we well, it's short term anyway. It's it's made a huge difference, mm -hmm. and the whole office has changed as a result, right? It's, mm -hmm. We're rocking and rolling. It's a hard thing to do as a leader, though, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to come to that point. It's a hard thing to express it. It's a hard thing to sell it, yeah. right? And, and so, but that's part of, again, that's part of being a leader, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it maybe it doesn't work. I mean, in your and case, maybe it doesn't. you know, but I think you have to do it. You yep. have to do it also, if for nothing else is... Um, if there is still a chance to save the situation, 
you will then you will make a difference. And if it's not, at least you will not invest any more time uh, in this situation, which is actually potentially bringing frustration for you and the and team. For everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, part of that is something I learned in negotiating. You know, in, when I was an attorney in, in law school, which is. You've got to almost get to the point where you're willing to walk away from it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? If you're not willing to walk away from it, you're not going to, you're not going to be successful negotiating a deal. Mm -hmm. And I, and I yeah. think that's where I got to with yeah. this particular individual, yeah, and, and it, 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 it that in particular worked. So we we've <laughs> we've come all yeah. over here <laughs> today, but let let you know what else about DevOps leadership mm -hmm. do you think our mm -hmm. audience would like to? share or hear from you all. I actually wanted to follow up on something Finn said before, um, where I, th I think he said something along the lines of you change the culture first and then the technology mm -hmm. follows, where I've always thought of it as kind of the other way around, right? How do you change the culture? You change the culture by changing the process that you're using. Mm -hmm. And I've seen companies get paralyzed. You know, we can't well, we can't do DevOps. Our culture doesn't support it, you yeah, know. And yeah. then, oh, we're going to have to change the culture first. Yeah, I think it's it's not like a, there's no playbook for changing culture. No. That's really. I, about, wish there I wish there was. <laughs> but it's like you said, it's like being human. It's it's like showing a, a vision. It's getting in with the teams. It's having some belief, having some heart, things like that. Uh, but you know, and to actually share that there isn't a, like a hidden agenda here. Like mm -hmm. we're not going to get rid of half the workforce. You know, we're actually going to give ourselves more capacity through doing this. You know, um, but it's it's iterative, really. So yeah. you, you do both. So yeah. I think you have to start with some cultural aspects, and then you start some of the transformation. Then you readjust and, and so on, because the people in the, in the company. Uh, they're the right people. They might be square pegs in, in square holes, but they're now the wrong color because the company's moving on and they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of do as you say. You either you know, get them to change or you get them to do the best work of their career somewhere else. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. But you have get to on with your life's work, as exactly. they say, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's some element of at least building trust in where you're going before you start the yeah. process changes. Have you seen my but presentation? That's, like, that's the whole purpose of it. It's, you're right, trust is that trust. Is this is a fun trust. guessing game. We'll try to figure you know out what, what he's going to say. Yeah. We had the Verizon folks in earlier, and they, they're an exciting bunch, right? They, this is all Ross Clanton and, and Sanjeev. I forget Sanjeev's last name right now. But they've done a tremendous job on their culture. And look, Verizon's not an easy no an easy organization, you know, but they've gamified, they have this thing called the DevOps Cup, right, where you get points for doing certain DevOps related tasks and, and person, you know, people win the cup and they, and they, you know, all of these kinds of things that they're doing, bringing sales into the equation, right, and helping them, the sales team to find, help to find business uh, planning and, and, and goals and so forth. So. You can change the culture. There, there may not, there is no playbook. But I will tell you that still four and a half years into DevOps.com, biggest question, two biggest questions we get. How do I kick off my DevOps transformation? Mm -hmm. And how do I change our mm -hmm. culture to be more DevOps friendly? Mm -hmm. um, and I, in four and a half years, I still, if I, if I had a good answer, maybe I'd be mm -hmm. vacationing right now instead of working. But yeah. I don't, I don't have the answer. But you yeah. have some books no, on it, it's Finn. You have some books yeah. on it. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that we get uh, going out and talking to companies about cloud adoption. We hear the same thing. How do I change my culture? And I, I think um, it's logical in a sense, right? Because your culture is developed to support what you've done in the past. And yeah. obviously, it hasn't developed to support what you're going to do in the future because that isn't what you've been doing, right? So everybody's going to have this culture obstacle. Yeah. And then the question is, you know, how do you get the ball rolling on changing both the process and the culture? Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. And, and what's surprising to me is sometimes people think it's easy. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed people who say, you know, this, we didn't get the results we were looking for in our DevOps transformation. <laughs> this cultural change is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did someone yeah. promise you a rose garden? I mean, yeah. you know, what made you think it was easy? If it was easy, we'd all do it like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. We wouldn't, you know, need the books and know all of this. So it, it, it is an interesting conundrum. Mm -hmm. And 
you know what, I, I look forward to seeing both of your presentations. All three of your presentations will be available on the IT Revolution YouTube channel. So those of you watching at home, when, by the time you see this, of course, does will be over for uh, here in London this year. But you can check out this presentation and all of the other presentations on IT Revolution YouTube. And you, you can check out, a, a, of course, a bunch of our sessions here on DevOps TV as well. But guys, we're going to need to call a wrap on this one. Thank you all for presenting it does. Thank you for coming and sharing with us here on DevOps TV. And continued success. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank Thank you. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com and DevOps TV at DevOps Enterprise Summit UK 2018. Have a great day.